This is episode 122 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast, Five Ways to Prevent Falls in Nursing Homes. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia Attorneys Rob Schenk and Will Smith. Hey out there, welcome back. My name is Rob Schenk. And I'm Will Smith. And we are your hosts for this episode. We have a very informative episode this week. Um, we're going to be talking about a super duper problem that occurs in nursing homes across the country, and that is serious injury and 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 sometimes death that occurs after a resident has fallen. Um, residents are falling from their beds. They're falling from out of their wheelchairs. They're falling as they're um, walking around. Um, I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a big problem. I, I'd say that it's, it's, you know, one of the major, I mean, along with bed sores and, and, and chemical restraints and physical restraints, falling is a major issue. Yeah. And, but we're, we're not going to have this conversation alone. In fact, we have a, yeah. a special guest. Her name is Diane Carter and Diane actually was on our show back in February of 2019, uh, talking about restraints, uh, restraints actually. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So, uh, for those that haven't heard that episode or want to know more about Diane, Will, what, what can you say about her? Well, she recently left her position as the founder, president, and CEO of the American Association on Post-Acute Care Nursing. Um, that's a, a PACN. A PACN, A-A-P-A-C-N, uh, representing directors of nursing and nurse assessment coordinators in nursing homes. It was there that she managed the organization's growth to some 17,000 nurse members across the country. She was active in the development of the MDS 3.0 in the early 1990s, which is a phenomenal um, accomplishment, and all regulation that affects long-term care since. She has served on many technical expert panel panels related to long-term care regulation over her career, she served on the Advancing Excellence Campaign Steering Committee, the Board of Directors of the Colorado uh, Culture Change Coalition, and is a member of the GIRO uh, Coalition through the Hartford Institute with New York University. And um, we're that's a mouthful, and we're super happy to have her on. Diane, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, glad to have you back on, on board again, this time talking about... Um, about falls in, in nursing homes. And I guess um, we we often hear um, that, you know, when people fall, it's usually uh, an, an, an older person. And it's my understanding that there are statistics that show that not only do older people fall more often than, than younger folks, but older people that are in nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities fall even more often than the general older population. Mm -hmm. So I guess the opening salvo, the, the first question is, why is that so? Like, why are falls happening so often with our, our older population? So, uh, to your point that you just made, let me just add a little bit to that, is the leading cause of nursing home admission is for rehab due to a fall outside of a nursing home. Oh, Someone wow. falls at home, they lose their independence, they need to go into rehab, so they land in a nursing home. The other thing is that, just for the why of this topic, is that Millions of people, 65 and older, fall each year. In mm -hmm. fact, one out of four older adults falls, whether in their home or in the nursing home. And if you fall once, you're very, very likely to fall twice. They're serious. They're cost costly. Mm -hmm. And one out of five falls usually cause serious injury, like a broken bone or head injury. And the thing that's so dangerous about head injuries, just briefly, is they cause uh, they can result in long-term changes in vision, reasoning, emotions, memory, and other mental disability or mental disabilities. And the thing right. is, that's what leads to an admission to a nursing home long-term. We know that according to several different studies, that about 13% of nursing home admissions mm -hmm. are the result of a fall. You fell in the home, you end up in the ER, you have hip surgery, you land in the nursing home, and then it sort of tends to progress from there in terms of a decline. So it's a very serious issue. Now, why do elders fall? Some very important reasons, but the top three reasons are chronic health conditions such as heart disease, dementia, and low blood pressure, 
which can cause dizziness. And, of mm-hmm. course, that's always usually a factor in someone stumbling or losing their balance. And um, it's also just a part of the natural aging um, process. The mm-hmm. thing that I've experienced myself is my father is 90, and he goes to exercise three times a week. Wow. For a while, that, that kept him upright. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you can see now that he is also experiencing the decline in spite of his, you know, will to stay healthy and upright. But anyway, um, so it's just a part of natural aging, as much as I hate to say that out loud with regards to him. In Australia, injuries caused by falls are the most common cause of death of people over 75, and I wouldn't doubt one bit that that wouldn't be the case in the United States. Wow. Um, yeah, what? you know, I, I actually just had oh. lunch with, with another attorney uh, recently whose law partner, I, I want to say that he's probably about 65. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in the newspapers here. He got up in the middle of the night and fell and is now paralyzed completely. Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's, yeah, it's dangerous. It's insane how, how things like that can happen. It's very dangerous. And here are the risk factors for falls. Well, we already mentioned old age. Mm-hmm. A history of past falls, of course, sets the stage for further falls. Cognitive impairment. Um, impairments in walking, dressing, and toileting. Frequently, toileting needs lead to falls. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk more about that later. Lower extremity weakness or other disabilities, such as peripheral neuropathy or numbness of the feet or lessening of, of muscle strength. And I'll mention a couple additional things about that shortly. But that's very common in older people. Impaired or unstable balance or gait, dizziness, arthritis, stroke, poor visual acuity, lower body mass, um, joint pain and weakness, and poor vision. A big issue is side effects of medication. They They play an important role in what happens with older people and falls. And, of course, in your home, oftentimes, you know, a physical therapist will come in and look at your shoes, throw rugs, slick floors. I mean, there's all kinds of environmental concerns that lead to falls. There's respiratory difficulty. And then your reflexes are just slower. I noticed that with my dad. I noticed that with my dad where he just can't, you know, catch his balance if he starts to fall. Um, And one thing I had never heard of was... um, a thing called cataplexy, which had to do with a sudden episode of muscle weakness and falling down Mm -hmm. without loss of consciousness. And this is related to narcolepsy, which I'm very familiar with. But apparently these episodes are caused by emotion, they believe. So if you've had a very upsetting situation, you're maybe more likely to, you know, have difficulties. So those are the risk factors. It's a lengthy list, but it's certainly something that affects many elderly people. And and that and that certainly answers the question of why that 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 population is more likely to fall than other populations because you're checking off a list of many things that aren't applicable to younger folks. Right. So yeah, right. That's from right. a basic yeah. standpoint, yeah. Um, is there um, a time in the average day of a nursing home resident? in which, given all those risk factors, that a fall is more or less likely to occur? Well, I'll tell you what. When I was the director of nursing a bazillion years ago, (laughs) we looked at, we pulled together all of the falls within our facility, and I've seen this throughout the data over the past, well, I won't even tell you how many years. But um, the... um, one of the biggest issues is um, that I was going to get to is, so what happens in a nursing home in terms of um, uh, uh, staffing is around when meals are served, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, many of the staff and about half of the residents go to the dining room to eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And so they're in there helping people with feeding and eating they're able to feed themselves. There's very minimal staffing on the nursing unit. And then, of course, if people have not been offered an opportunity to toilet before all this staff moves to the dining room, you see all the time people that are on the unit 
need help, can't get assistance, and they end up falling, trying mm-hmm. to get to the bathroom by themselves. Either because they, and this is also very common, is unfortunately, either because they delayed going to the toilet for a very long time and they often slip in their own urine, or because they just waited too late and they just can't get there and they fall, you know, with or without the, you know, that slip risk. Mm-hmm. But those are critical issues in terms of looking at the uh, risk for falls. Mm. That makes sense. I mean, that's a that's an underlying issue in in, in many of our cases that are in yeah. many of our cases that are not even fall related is the lack of staffing, and so yep. kind of you kind of like an indirect point that you made is that <laughs> staffing is important. So when there's meal time. If there is adequate staff, they're dealing with the meal preparation, the meal delivery versus, well, right. did Miss Johnson um, go to the bathroom before this? Uh, well, we'll just check after we get through feeding, you know, such and such a person. And then that's that's unfortunately when it happens. And it's because you might not have enough hands to take care of everything. Well, wow. and um, like I think it was last week I saw an article in McKnight's 43,000 open positions for direct care staff in nursing homes. So don't get me started on staffing. There just are not enough staff. Absolutely. And this is what creates this, you know, danger of accidents. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's one of those things where, like, I feel like every few years when we were in elementary, middle school, and, and high school, there would be these reports about the most needed – um, or the, 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 um, what do you call it? The projections for employment, like you're most likely to get a job in these industries because the, the demand right. is up and it was always nursing for a, my whole, right. the whole time it was nursing. If you want to be a nurse, you will get a job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So we understand a little bit better the, the, the individuals that have more risk for falling. We understand a little bit better, um, when falls are more likely to occur. Um, what about, we know that, what are some ways that we can prevent falling other than obviously having enough staff? Um, but even if you have enough staff, what are some things that that, that the nursing home can do to prevent uh, injuries from falls? So we mentioned staffing. Uh, one of the things that all people need to be aware of, in particular family members, is that medications need to be dosed at approximately a half to a third left. Because older people's liver and kidney function is compromised, they have a lower body weight, and they may suffer from malnutrition. These medications are very strong, and they can lead to dizziness and falls. Uh, there's also the issue of any time I see a medication change, am I looking at what those risks are associated with that particular drug? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a greater risk of falls in the first six weeks after admission. So it's really important to be alert to alert staff and be very cognizant of that additional risk factor. We know that drugs cause toxicity and looking at those therapeutic levels and being certain that they're correct for older people is important. Psychotropic drugs, when we're treating especially behavioral issues with antipsychotics is absolutely inappropriate and these drugs cause many falls in long-term care. Mm-hmm. Diuretics are another drug, uh, water pills, uh, probably most of the public is familiar with these, frequently call, cause issues with um, low blood pressure because it causes someone to have to go to the bathroom more frequently. Uh, and you see an, yeah, and you see an increase in incidence of low blood pressure, which again, mm-hmm. the cardiovascular drugs, I think I've mentioned dizziness, weakness, fatigue, some of the, um, I already mentioned, is something changed? Whenever I see a fall or anything happen that looks different than what I've seen in the past, I start thinking about drugs. Mm-hmm. Digitalis is a heart rate uh, drug, dilatant for seizures, diuretic seizures. I mean, there are many organizations out there fighting tooth and toenail to get rid of all these antipsychotics in nursing mm-hmm. homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, other risks include an unstable gait. And you want to look for, is there a good restorative program in place? Are clothing sizes right? Do their shoes fit? You know, as you lose a lot of weight, your shoes get a lot looser and you see stumbling. You want gait training, either from nurses or PT. Mm -hmm. 
hearing and vision can cause a lot of problems with not understanding your environment. Infections. I remember when I was a DON, how many times did I figure out, I figured out it was an infection because someone fell first. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes the first sign of a upper respiratory or a urinary tract infection is a fall. Mm. Oddly, I mean, it's they don't spike a fever usually if they're very old. So, mm-hmm. um, low blood sugars. We're seeing many, many more people with uh, diabetes in the nursing home, and that can it, cause just just fall. to just to be clear for the audience is the reason why that it's a first sign of infection for you that or the fall is a first sign of infection is because that all attributes to dizziness. Um, it attributes to dizziness, but also because the resident does not spike a fever and you don't see the usual signs of mm-hmm. infection in someone who's very elderly, mm-hmm. the first sign may be that they fell. Mm. And then you call and you start asking questions, and then you find out they do have a UTI or a urinary tract infection or mm-hmm. an upper respiratory infection. It can be the first sign as a fall right. of the infection, yeah. Uh, dehydration, we all know that that, uh, just from personal experience, how that can cause dehydration. Constipation is another problem. Pain. And then there are just bazillions of things I could talk about, but I won't today, in terms of doing an environmental assessment around lighting, furniture, floors, accessible call lights. Mm-hmm. Of course, accessible call lights being almost the most important is can they get help if they need it? And then, of course, you got to answer the call light. <laughs> right. That's right. And that goes to, so, if, if I can interject, that goes directly to the toileting issue most of the time. Exactly. Is, the, is that if, if, exactly. if they need to go to the bathroom, they're going to hit the button. And if somebody doesn't right. come, they would rather chance walking to the bathroom than, than go in the bed. Mm-hmm. And that's when the fall occurs. Right. Right. Um, can I, Dan? Yeah. You said something very interesting, and I don't. I'm not quite sure if we talked about this in your previous episode, but you mentioned something along the lines of whatever the medication is, um, it needs to be reduced by a certain percentage because they're they're too strong. Um, can you speak to that? And to should the generally don't the physicians already take that into account? Well. You, act, you hope that the physicians take it into account. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, I mean, doctors are only required to come to the facility uh, twice for 30 days, and then every 90 days thereafter. Mm. So they're not going to know how a drug is affecting yeah. a resident. But nurses should be alert and cognizant of the fact that, you know, someone has um, gotten a drug and what effect it seems to be having on them. There are certain drugs where you routinely draw tox levels just to see if, if how they're reacting to the medication. And those are things that are done routinely, like Dilantin mm-hmm. um, and Digitalis. So you want to just be uh, aware that any time a drug changes, so someone's functioning fairly well, and then all of a sudden you see that they're sleeping in their wheelchair, they're not eating the kinds of foods they usually eat. I mean, a nurse aide is often the very best person to see, oh, she always eats sweets, and Mm -hmm. now she's not interested in any of her food, or, you know, those kind of subtle changes. And they can be quite subtle. But yes, those need to be uh, looked at very carefully. Right. Um, And you mentioned bright lights. You mentioned... um I believe you mentioned fall pads, that kind of thing. Um, w- w- how common are those? Like, w- um, well, I think um, it's a it's a part of an overall assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I think of like lighting, you know, a lot of nursing homes, as a for example, okay, for example, a lot of nursing homes, you know, and they have these long hallways with a door at the end mm-hmm. with a window there. So as a resident heads down that hallway, the closer they get to that really bright light right in their eyes, Mm. they're much more likely to fall. Yeah. These weird patterns and carpetings and things like that. There are certain colors that should be used. I mean, there's all sorts of things that need to be assessed and really thought of as you're looking at uh, care in a facility. So... I'm not sure if I answered your question, but no, you did. There's, no, that was there's, right on. there's all kinds of things you need to look at. I, that's just really skimming the surface of all of these issues. Lighting in the rooms. I mean, just all kinds of things that really, really help with preventing falls. 
and, that are environmental. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what are some of the signs that, physical signs, that someone has fallen? Well, um, I mean, I would tend to look for, of course, bruising, skin tears, um, any sort of assessment about how those happened, and people should have some understanding of that. We used to say, oh, everybody has skin tears. Everybody has, mm -hmm. or, you know. Well, now, I mean, we really need to be looking at skin tears. How are they treated? This is mm -hmm. the person on Coumadin, for instance, uh, anticoagulant. What's being done to prevent any kind of skin tears? Uh, and so there's a whole list of assessments that can be done to, 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 I don't know if the right word, you're a lawyer, but you know, you're trying to mitigate against those things happening again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People do get skin tears. They do get, you know, they fall different things, but, um, you know, the vast majority of falls, as I mentioned, they're strengthening, never lead to injury, but we need to be understanding why it occurred anyway. It's not something like, oh, well, he falls all the time. Right. And it used to be much more uh, of a, I would call it an ageist attitude. Of, well, they're old. That always happens to old people. There's nothing you we can do. We don't want to right. see that. Yeah. We want someone to look at the what happened, mm -hmm. what are the risk factors, and how are we going to change the care to make it so the person doesn't have any sort of events like that again. Mm -hmm. It may happen anyway, but mm -hmm. you want to know that that was looked at. Right, and I think that anytime it's there's a a red light should go off is if you do have skin tears accompanied with diminished capacity, um, right? Because that's definitely a sign that there's been some type of head trauma with the fall. But um, can you speak a right. little bit about you mentioned Coumadin? Um, why yeah. is why is Coumadin relevant to um, assessing a fall and 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 associated with falls? Well, it's it's an anticoagulant, right? Because so many people, as they age, uh, develop atrial fibrillation is actually the diagnosis, and then they'll put them on some Coumadin to um, address the atrial fibrillation. So here's the issue. That needs to be measured every week. Those results need to mo be monitored very, very closely. Um, they need to go to the physician. The physician needs to be looking at what's going on. And those med and warfarin or Coumadin are what cause the skin tears. Or I don't know if you've ever seen. It's just a horrible sight when an elderly person's on Coumadin and they fall. And their whole side of their face is bruised up and their elbows. And, and of course, once the bleeding is you know started under the surface of the skin, you're going to see some skin tears because that drug is uh, just predisposes you to um, issues with bleeding under mm -hmm. the skin. It's an anticoagulant, and so you know, really, just the smallest uh, bump can cause bruising that doesn't look too hot. Now, having said that, I mean, there's a way. There are ways to distinguish between what's normal bump bruising whatever, and maybe somebody hit somebody or something, you know, something really horrible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I probably can't go into that today, but we have means of understanding how those things occur, and it's not just, you know, oh, well, well, they're old, right. which you used to hear all the time. Yeah. Um, Diane, walk us through um, how, do, how do families get involved with fall prevention in nursing homes with their loved ones? Like, what, what are some of the steps they can take to make sure that they're loved one is as safe as possible from the injuries from falls? Well, um, I'm going to, you know, return to my, <laughs> I'm going to back into my nursing background because <laughs> this is absolutely so important. By all means, um, go ahead. <laughs> it's, worth no it's worth noting that um, in a study done in hospitals in America, 38% to 78% of the falls can be anticipated. Wow. That means to me they could have been prevented. Right. And I believe this is true in nursing homes as well, not just hospitals. So the very, very most important step, first thing to do is the minute that your relative is admitted to a nursing home, the family member needs to be there and demand if it's not already being done. And I don't mean a federally mandated tool like the MDS. I mean getting in there and ensuring that an extensive, detailed nursing assessment was done 
to identify all of the risk factors I've just mentioned. I went through that whole list and that and what effect that might have on the resident. And those family members can tell you, if not the residents, I don't mean to speak for the residents, mm -hmm. but the family members need to be there talking about he's been at home, he's had, you know, several falls, this is what we think happens. So you get a good sense of assessment in terms of this particular individual and what happens to them. Mm -hmm. Then you want to look at, um, you know, what are the interventions uh, the, the nursing interventions that should have been done to preclude the fall. For instance, the one I think of most commonly is this issue with trying to get to the bathroom and not having access because of staffing. And in that case, if the person has urgency to get to the bathroom or whatever the assessment might be, be certain you're addressing that. Mm -hmm. And so what you're going to do is basically do what's called an extensive bowel and bladder program which identifies when the resident is most likely to need to use the toilet with follow-through by staff to take them to the toilet. It's absolutely critical. You'll prevent the majority of falls by doing that. Um, and it needs to be, I've mentioned, for 100, 100 times. Many of the, regular, the federal regulations wouldn't be necessary if we would just individualize the assessment for each resident. Yeah. So you want to go through your list of risk factors and identify what the risk factors are and then uh, look at what the nursing intervention should be, and um, and then you develop a care plan. And family members should be involved in that care planning and understanding and watching out, too, for, you know, I've got a care plan for my father or mother, and, you know, is the nurse aide or whoever assists with toileting or whatever the issue might be, mm -hmm. are they following you know, through? Is it getting done? And then there needs to be that continuous evaluation. Like I said, you have a set of medications. The fewer medications, the better. I mean, the requirement is not seven to nine, but it should be even less than that. You are constantly evaluating and going through your process of, okay, has something changed? We didn't have any falls for six months. Now we're having a fall. A fall. Was it a med? Was it, you know, what was it? And then do we see staff, you know, that have been educated and are competent in following through? And so I like to say, you know, as our title said, you know, what are the five uh, most common causes of, or ways to prevent falls is, and this is the nursing process. You do an assessment. You do an intervention and a care plan. Mm -hmm. You continuously evaluate. And, of course, you follow through. And, you know, the care plan is only going to be as good as the people who are, you know, following through on implementation of that care plan. And that family member is just so instrumental to getting that plan down to a very institute or individualized assessment that meets the needs of their residents. And again, you know, I already mentioned it, but I can't, I can't say enough about staffing. It's pretty much all I read these days because it's sort of, you know, my cross to bear to keep right. talking about sure, staffing yeah. and nursing yeah. help. Well, that's it seems to be an over an, an overarching theme of all these shows is family participation and staffing. But um, Diane, you've been marvelous once again. Um, this is all yeah. great information that our audience can definitely use in the future. Um, yeah. How do people um, get in contact with you if they want to if they want to um, ask a question or if they're if they're a nurse out there and wants to participate and and we were calling it a packin. Like, how do you how do you shorten um, the American Association on Post Acute Care Nursing? Well, uh, I call it a packin. Yeah, a packin. I, I got yeah. it. I got it. Okay, very good. How do people, it. how do people get a hold of you? Okay, my email address is uh, Diane Carter, mm -hmm. D I A N E C A R T E R L T C, as in long term care. So it's L T C dot rn at gmail.com and, and we're going to put that up there uh, yeah it'll be on the screen for everybody yeah. um well fantastic and oh yeah go ahead. let me mm -hmm. let me mention two other things when you're looking at an admission for a resident in a nursing home ask about staffing get all the information that you can as you're walking around maybe visiting a facility mm -hmm. watch to see if call lights are answered quickly ah, yeah 
critical pieces. Oh, that's a good advice. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Diane. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. It's and, been fun. <laughs> all right. We'll talk to you next time, Diane. Thank you. All right. Take care. Great. Bye bye. A packin'. A packin'. A packin'. Um, she started that organization. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, she's, that, the, yeah, no, yeah. she's the founder, founder, president, and CEO of the yep. American Association Which on is, Post-Acute Care Nursing. Yep, a packin. It used to be ANAC. Yeah. Now it's a packin. She she has an amazing um, background. Uh, I mean, she she worked on the MDS 3.0 in the early 90s. That's a for those of us that work on on nursing home cases or deal with nursing home, the MDS is is a very well known um uh, assessment and, and and data um tool so that that's amazing that she did that she's og yeah og og mds yeah um well that's going actually that's not going to i want an announcement the little housekeeping matter there is a certain individual that's sitting at this table that is not me mm -hmm. that as of wednesday mm. will be 40 one years old 41 will smith turning 41 41 the big four one yep so what do you what are your plans um nothing i don't really i, I never really celebrate my birthday i mean 30 was kind of a cool you know like hey i'm in my 30s and 40 was you know finally a milestone hey i'm 40 years old but now it's who cares you know you know what we need to do is we need to like do like from now forever from now on. Yeah, is we're gonna go out you and I to a steak place mm -hmm. and consume that many whatever the year is that many, many ounces? ounces in in tomahawk steak. Oh, they they've got a 41, 40 ounce tomahawk tomahawk steak. No problem. Yeah. yeah, we need to go to we need to go sit. We need to go to Marcel's. Mm, we haven't been to Marcel's yet yeah. for the tomahawk. Um, and they have a, a Cote de Bouffe, it, which is a, a French method of, of, it's just a big French Where they steak. cook it in like beef fat? Um, I'm not really sure how they do it, to yeah. be honest with you, but it's it looks amazing. But 41, I remember that. I remember turning 41. Yeah, taco, six months ago. Yeah, had a yeah. taco party. Anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so, all right. Well, with that, happy birthday to Will. Um, you can consume each and every episode of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast every Monday morning. On our website, which is nursinghomeabusepodcast.com, or on our webs uh, on the YouTube channel, or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts from. And with that, we will see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.